Welcome everyone to the American Civil War Museum's Homefront Education Series while we walk through the war with you. My name is Joseph and I am joined by Stephanie Arduini, the Deputy Director of the American Civil War Museum. And today we have entered into the final year of the war, 1865. And Stephanie, as we're entering into 1865, what are people feeling? How is it different? What are the changes that are happening? So for the majority of the war, so for what's been about four years, people have felt just chaos. Things couldn't get worse and then they do. There's not an end in sight. But after the election of Abraham Lincoln, things start to change a little bit. Confederates viewed Lincoln's election as the thing that they hoped wouldn't happen because his steadfastness on the idea of finishing the war, whatever it would take, they were hoping that he would lose and that they could find some sort of compromise or way to end or get some momentum back. But by this point, after his re-election and with supplies running tight, soldiers running in short supply, it felt like the end was actually near. And by April 1865, the pieces were moving in such a way that the end became palpable. Wow. Yeah. And so April is significant. <laughs> Many of the, the major Civil War events are happening in April. And so as we've entered into April of 1865 and the United States Army, specifically the Army of the Potomac, is surrounding both Petersburg and Richmond, well, that's when word ends up going up that the Confederate capital needs to be evacuated. Absolutely. Robert E. Lee sent word to Jefferson Davis here in Richmond that Grant had broken through his lines at Petersburg, which was part of the main defenses of the city, so he needed to get out of town. So Jefferson Davis had already thought this might happen soon, and he'd already sent his family away into safety, but still scrambled to gather the Confederate government, supplies, military, and evacuate the city. And there's this famous lithograph of the Confederate evacuation of Richmond, because one thing that happened is a Confederate officer set fire to some supplies to keep them from falling into United States military hands, mm -hmm. and the fire got, went out of control as the wind picked up embers, and it burned a large chunk of the business and shipping district and manufacturing district of the city. So there's flames, there's this whole train of people evacuating across the James River, and it's amazing to imagine the feeling of people who were in the capital of the Confederacy and imagining their enemy, which both sides had been villainizing the other pretty intently throughout the whole war, and knowing that that caricature was about to enter your city and not knowing what that would mean. The next morning, as the city is still burning, United States colored troops are right there, right at the head of the United States Army as they approach Richmond and enter the city, and the United States military puts out the fire. The, it's amazing to imagine, for example, from the perspective of this one particular soldier named Garland White, who was born into slavery around Richmond, sold away when he was 12, had found a way to escape t to freedom, mm -hmm. taught himself to learn how to read before becoming a recruiter and then a chaplain with the United States Colored Troops, and he's right there with his regiment coming back into the city where he was born right. and imagining what that meant symbolically, because we know throughout the war, wherever the United States Army went, that's where emancipation was following. Right. And enslaved people in the second largest site of the domestic slave trade here in Richmond knew that when the Confederates were evacuating, that that meant freedom, right. that meant emancipation. Right. So there's this moment of despair from Confederate supporters, jubilation from enslaved people in the midst of this chaos, all coming together on the same day. I mean, over the course of hours, people who even had been living in the city of Richmond who were white Southerners but who did not agree with the Confederacy, they're now experiencing these other feelings as well. And Garland White's story ends with another kind of interesting twist because as he's re-entering the city from which he had been sold at a very young age, from away from his mother, he actually reunites with her. Uh, as someone comes up and says, Chaplain, there is a, a woman who says that she's looking for a, a son that had been sold away, and basically that he might fit the bill. So he talks to this woman and he discovers that it is in fact her mother, that this is his mother, that this is a reunion 
of many different types, a reunion of the city of Richmond with the Union, and a reunion of families across uh, the South. And that flows on, that reunion kind of continues as we see uh, later on uh, at Appomattox, only a few days later, the surrender of Robert E. Lee and the Army of Northern Virginia to General Grant. Absolutely. And I think another key part that I'll throw in before Appomattox is that the day after the United States Army arrives, Abraham Lincoln himself right. comes to visit the city. And a key part of that is he's visiting the city and trying to just visit the Confederate capital, the enemy capital that had been the object of the war for so long. He's there and imagining what's coming next. We see some clues in people's memories that he's starting to think about how do you move a country from fighting and killing each other into trying to move that forward into something that's whole. So as Grant is accepting Robert E. Lee's surrender just about an hour's drive west of here from right. Richmond, well, we also have our other location for those who need to know. Uh, it's a moment of trying to imagine what does the war mean now that things are coming to a close. Robert E. Lee was the most significant surrender. He wasn't the only one, and it would take months for all of these other bits of the Confederate Army and Navy to finally surrender and come under control. But with Lee's surrender to Grant, the writing was on the wall. And United States colored troops were there at that moment knowing and feeling the weight of that significance. Oh, absolutely. And that's that's really important to know too, that that is what the surrender at Appomattox is what sets off that wave of other surrenders. And as we of course know from the holiday, Juneteenth, uh, it would be months before people are actually uh, fully free, even after the war is more or less ended. Uh, but between that surrender at Appomattox and the final uh, surrenders of the Confederacy, one other important event also occurs. So on April 14th, Abraham Lincoln is assassinated and he dies the following day on April 15th. So imagine yourself in Civil War America, no matter what your allegiances or opinions were, to hear of Jefferson Davis and the Confederate evacuation of Richmond on April 2nd, and less than two weeks later, You've got Abraham Lincoln's death right there on the eve when the country is trying to put itself back together and imagine, imagining what's coming next. And it's, it, we feel like we're in overwhelming news cycles right now, but that is a lot of really huge history-making events that's happening in that space of two weeks. And over the course of the war, this has resulted in the death of 750,000 Americans. And now you have four million Americans who are now free from the institution of slavery. Whoever is coming after Abraham Lincoln, so in this case Andrew Johnson, as well as Congress, have a monumental task of how do you balance healing and reconciliation and reunion with punishment? How do you make it clear that to the United States what the Confederates were doing was treason? It was armed rebellion against the country. So how do you balance both of those things and try to create a path forward that also protects the civil and human rights of the formerly enslaved people? Yeah, and that's an important question, one that we will try to explore. Uh, I don't think we'll get a full rule answer yet, but one that we will certainly try to explore as we move into the final stage, this last session with all of you, that is making meaning of all of what has happened. So stay tuned.